All right. Hi, my name is Travis Lindsay. I am here for the Center for Entrepreneurship at Cal State Fullerton. And with me today during this interview will be uh, Chethan Shrikant. He's a PhD. Did, did, I, did I pronounce that right? Yeah, Chethan? absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you're a associate, associate professor for the management department at Cal State Fullerton. And as of this August, you are the director for the Gianneschi Center. Uh, so, Chethan, please uh, introduce yourself to everybody, to the Cal State Fullerton Entrepreneurship Community, and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah. Uh, as Travis said, I'm uh, Chethan Shrikant. Uh, I did my PhD in uh, Canada uh, in a place called uh, London, which is midway between Detroit and uh, Toronto, uh, Ivy Business School. Uh, my higher after uh, my first job after uh, my PhD has been Cal State Fullerton, I joined here August 2016, uh, recently got my tenure. And uh, as Travis said, this August is when uh, I was approached to lead the academic side of the center. So I'm the academic director of the center. Uh, before, uh, before my PhD, I was in the corporate world for almost a decade. Uh, I like giving the statistics that uh, I lived in, lived and worked in three different continents, four different countries, nine different cities. Uh, that that's a great experience, uh, life experience that I've had. Opened my mind to a lot of things. Uh, uh, but yeah, that's that's in brief about me. So four different countries, nine different cities. That's three a lot. Three different, different continents. Three different. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Asia, North America, Europe. Yeah, UK. Okay. Yeah, okay, UK. That's right. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, so for somebody like that, uh, it it clicks in my mind that okay, th th this person must actually really enjoy and you know embody what he does, which is transformation. Mm -hmm. So you're you're a, a transformational kind of guy, uh, and that's currently you know if if you look up the uh, uh, page for your center on, on the Cal State Fullerton website, it says that you're currently undergoing transformation. Mm -hmm. uh, so can, can you speak a little bit about that? I mean, how, how, why is transformation important to yourself personally and in business? Um, I'll actually put a precursor to the transformation. I'm, I'm the kind of person who likes connecting dots. Uh, so in some ways I've connected dots across the globe. Uh, that's how I look at my travel. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's kind of the precursor for transformation because unless you connect things that haven't been connected before, unless you build this constellation out of just stars which are out there, you'll not be able to imagine things in a different way. And I think that's where transformation comes in. And for the center, uh, that again fits well, uh, that uh, philosophy, because my whole approach has been that this has to be a collaborative platform. Uh, it should not be a silo. It should not be something which is my kingdom kind of a thing. It should be something where I can enable people to connect, people to do things through a collaborative thing. And just this uh, very podcast is kind of a, a result of that. I went to JJ and said, help me understand how you run the center. Uh, let's figure out ways in which we can collaborate. We had a 45 minute long meeting. And one of the things he said right at the end is that here's something that we can do right off the bat, you can talk to Travis. Uh, so that's that's been my philosophy and approach that for any kind of a transformation, you need to connect dots, you need to collaborate, you need to have that picture which is not yet created by simply uh, connecting those uh, dots uh, in essence. You know, I, I hate to break this to you, but talking to me is probably gonna be the highlight of your uh, directorship. <laughs> or or maybe low light, I'm not sure. Well, yeah. it's, it's, it's too soon to find out, but I, I really yeah. like, the picture that you're painting there and i know that you're you are, are somewhat of a, a poet reader are you also a poet yourself yeah yeah i've been writing since i was 15 years old poetry. okay so, you, so so you've been writing for about 15 years now no no uh, since i was 15 years old no i know ah i'm not 30 years old <laughs> <laughs> so so uh but uh you know uh connecting the dots you know it, it it immediately brought to mind you know that the story about like the ship of theseus right so it's the jason the argonauts their boat and they would you know switch out uh different planks and boards and all the other stuff uh, different sails 
And uh, the, the question is, is it, is it the same ship? Is it completely transformed? And uh, that, that, that's kind of how I see, you know, entrepreneurship in general and everything that we're doing. And I think that the way that you're going about it uh, at the GNSG Center is, is absolutely, you know, just perfect. Uh, trying to collaborate with all the different parts that are going on at Cal State Fullerton and in, in the general community. Uh, speaking about that, you know, social entrepreneurship, that's something that is near and dear to our heart at the Center for Entrepreneurship. And I, I believe it is uh, for yours, for you as well. Uh, can you explain how you're going to uh, impact uh, that world and, you know, help uh, develop and, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, help develop and uh, maybe curate a little bit uh, social entrepreneurs in the uh, CSUF community. Okay. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll first uh, give a very brief history lesson on the center itself, because I think that's relevant to the discussion we are having. Uh, so the, when the center was set up, uh, it was through uh, through the funds which Harry Janeshi, uh, who was a prolific fundraiser for uh, uh, the university, it was through his fund. After his uh, passing away, the center was named after him. And his goal was uh, for the money to go towards nonprofit related activities. So the center was center for nonprofit for a very, very long time. Uh, then when the last director left, it was kind of an orphan for a while. Uh, and uh, uh, Sridhar Sundaram, she, as we call him our Dean, he kind of reconceptualized it and said, this should be a center for social impact, have a broader impact. But the nonprofit side hasn't yet gone away from the center. Uh, and where I come from in terms of my own academic background, I believe in the good of uh, business. Uh, we know there is a lot of bad which happens in business, but I don't think we talk enough about the good that business can do. Social enterprise is right at that intersection. So from the center's perspective, we're looking at the entire landscape. We're still keeping the nonprofit side. I'm bringing in this emphasis, especially in terms of the local so, uh, small businesses uh, uh, and the good they are doing, the social impact they are doing, but the overlap part between nonprofit and local small businesses, that's where the social enterprises come in. Our social entrepreneurship as a mindset uh, comes in. Uh, and I think from, uh, from uh, your center's perspective, that's again where we'll have an overlap, but we'll also be working with nonprofit and small business. That's the first thing which uh, which I wanted to uh, kind of highlight. Perfect. So it, it, it's a holistic look at the economy, uh, understanding that, um, you know, as uh, I believe it was Dost uh, Dostoevsky's uh, uh, Alyosha was saying is that everything matters. Uh, so it's it's kind of in that same vein that you're working off of, right? So it's it's the for-profit businesses, it's the nonprofits, and it's all uh, everything else in between, correct? Yes, yes. And I, yeah. I see social enterprise as an uh, overlap between the two spheres. If you put a Venn diagram, it will be right in the middle. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I was. I. I just got done talking with one of uh, uh, the current Cal State Fullerton students. He's over in the engineering department, and he's working on developing a prosthetic arm mm -hmm. uh, with some of the other engineering students, and then also making it into an actual business. And I'm. And, and that's the kind of thing that I, you know, immediately think of uh, when you're talking about a, a social enterprise, right? So it's, it's something like that, correct? Yeah, it is. Uh, but the key, I think, is that uh, unlike nonprofits, which uh, in some ways don't do so well on the business side of things in terms of marketing, uh, operations, and other functional aspects, and businesses which almost think of social impact nowadays as a necessary thing to do, but not the main thing. Social enterprises have to look at both. They have to look at their social mission and they need to have a viable business. I think that's where they're different from those two entities. So it's not just a simple overlap, but the overlap means that it could either be best of both worlds or in some ways, worst of both worlds in terms of the challenges. So they'll have challenges with both nonprofit phase and business phase, but they'll also need to have expertise in both uh, worlds. Right. Yeah, and and I think it's just an uh, also an acknowledgement of something that's been true forever is that you know business, no matter why you're doing it, it does have a social impact. You know, mm -hmm. it depends on you know uh, obviously you're employing people, you're in the community, you're having an impact there. Uh, you know, no matter what you do, no matter how hard you try, you you, you can't uh, have zero impact. And so it, it's just an acknowledgement of that, right? Yes, yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So. Uh, 
So can, can you give us a, a look ahead and maybe give us a little bit of a sneak peek into some of the things that you're thinking of trying to accomplish with the Gianneschi Center? And I know you're, you're, you're just started, it's brand new. So some of these ideas, there's still, you know, uh, a bunch of disconnected not, uh, uh, dots right now, but uh, yes. maybe uh, a little bit look ahead. So uh, a, a few things. Uh, so through conversations, we've uh, kind of come to an idea of setting up theme-based labs. Uh, labs kind of mimicking what uh, hard sciences do, but also incorporating some of the elements of innovation experimentation within those labs. So there are two which are coalescing and becoming a little more uh, real. Uh, I have an accounting faculty who's going to work with me and he's going to lead a lab on ESG thought leadership. ESG stands for environmental social governance. It's kind of a a measurement framework with a lot of large companies use. I use it for my research. There are databases around it. So thought leadership in terms of producing research around that uh, space. So uh, that accounting faculty will lead that lab. I have another faculty from uh, my own department, management department, who will be leading uh, DEI wellness area. So that's the other theme. Uh, there are a couple of other things which I'm talking to different people about, but uh, they're not yet... Uh, as firm or as concrete as these two. Uh, but the idea behind labs is that social impact is so broad, this will give us these kind of self-contained units where we can do things in terms of research, in terms of student engagement, in terms of uh, outreach to community, which is just related to those labs. So that's one thing which has happened. Uh, second thing in terms of collaboration, apart from uh, uh, Center for Entrepreneurship, uh, the two other centers which uh, which we have concrete uh, things to do, uh, one with uh, the Small Business Development Center, another with the Family Business uh, uh, Center. Uh, with the Small Business Development Center, we are trying to build uh, a framework for measuring uh, the social impact of small businesses. And the example which I like giving there is that if you have a, a bagel shop or a bakery and you give your leftover uh, bagel at the end of the day to a homeless person around the corner, you are having social impact, but nobody is talking about it. Nobody is capturing it. No ESG database will ever acknowledge that little gesture, right? So that's why we are trying to build something which is relevant for us in Southern California for the local uh, businesses, a kind of a measurement framework. And to go about doing that, we're going to give, uh, so I teach uh, Management 440, which is an undergrad class on uh, business and society. Uh, so in that class, we're going to create group projects for about seven to eight groups, and each group will be assigned a small business, and they'll think about how they're going to evaluate their uh, social impact. And after a couple of iteration, we're going to use all of those uh, projects and start coming up with our own framework. In the long term, uh, the hope or the aspiration is that we'll have some kind of uh, a holistic metric uh, through which we can evaluate different businesses in Orange County and maybe give them different grades, uh, kind of a silver, gold, platinum, have an award ceremony, get them recognized they can put it in front of their uh, uh, storefront and say that, okay, we got this gold certification from uh, 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 Center for Social Impact at Casted Fullerton. That's the long-term aspiration, but in the short term, we'll at least have this going and the Small Business Development Center, Mike Daniels has been a great supporter for, for a lot of things I'm doing. Uh, so he's going to help me identify those seven companies and we're going to do that. Uh, with the Family Business Center, somewhat similar, but a little different as well. So they have an annual event coming up in March. And one of the, <clears throat> sorry, one of the themes that they were thinking about for their family business center members was identifying those who are doing well on social impact. Uh, so there we'll be doing a kind of a call for nomination. Uh, we come up with a, a, a tentative questionnaire, uh, which they'll fill out and uh, send back. And we're going to evaluate them and say, okay, these are the five uh, shortlisted uh, members and then interview them and then select one or two uh, awardees. So they're going to be awarded. So that's another collaboration which is uh, happening. So these are some of the things in terms of uh, uh, concrete efforts uh, that we are doing. Uh, the other thing which we want to continue doing is the nonprofit side, uh, kind of support them on the functional aspects. Because again, from a 
uh, social mission aspect. The nonprofits know what they're doing. They're passionate about it, but they often don't get the talent or they won't have the resources for marketing, finance, accounting, things like that. So maybe have workshop, not maybe we are, we are building workshops around some of those things for the nonprofit uh, side uh, so that their functional aspects become better. They get uh, uh, help from some of our amazing faculty across different departments. So I have an ISDS faculty who's helping me on that. I have a marketing faculty uh, and probably uh, uh, an HR person from my department. Uh, we also have a collaboration with Northampton University, uh, and they have this workshop on a theory of change, which is almost like strategizing for nonprofits. Uh, so that is going to happen. I'm I'm having a I'm building a very close relationship uh, with them. They have uh, a social innovation center at the university level, not just at a college level, and they're like 15 years ahead of me. So in some ways, they're also uh, a role model for me. Uh, uh, and the person who's the head, head of that center is also mentoring me in many ways. So that is also happening. Yes, it's been two months, but all of these things are already in play uh, within the last two months. So you haven't slept in two months, you know, congratulations on that. Uh, have you been keeping track of that? Making Are you, uh, you going to write, write a, a paper about sleep deprivation for two months straight? Uh, it's been sleep deprivation since 2010 when I started my PhD trials. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fair enough. No, I I, I get it. Uh, I've I, I've I've had a little bit more sleep lately, but yeah, I mean, I I I, I get it a little bit. So one of the things that has struck me in our conversation is that on on the one side of you is is the poet, right? Yeah. You, you see things. Uh, it's it's not so much numbers, and then on the other side is you know trying to measure everything, right? Yeah. So, so uh, maybe reconcile is, is too hard of a word, but how do you harmonize those two halves of yourself? Uh, it's interesting you caught on to that. In fact, my thesis was at the intersection of the two things. Again, it's a dot connector in me, right? Uh, okay. Because in our, in our field, at least, we have these two strong camps, qualitative researchers and quantitative researchers. The method I use, it is called fuzzy, fuzzy set qualitative comparative analysis. Sounds fancy, but it, 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 it's not uh, too complicated. It kind of merges those two elements. It brings in the qualitative element. And in my uh, thesis research specifically, I was qualitatively evaluating media reports about uh, opposition to LNG terminals. Uh, so kind of trying to figure out what's happening on a descriptive qualitative aspect and then bringing in the quantitative element and then seeing what are the patterns which emerge uh, or can we make broader generalization beyond just that one particular anecdotal uh, instance. So I've already been doing that uh, since my uh, thesis days. And I think somewhere I like bringing in those two things. And and again, I'm, I'm always that middle person. I'm always the gray area person. I'm never black and white. I'm very uncomfortable if things are black and white. I love it when it's gray. Uh, right. So this is, again, something like that. There is going to be a push and pull. There's going to be learning. There's going to be mistakes. But I'm not going to go completely quantitative. I'm not going to go completely qualitative. I'll try to find a way which is middle ground. Yeah. I mean, you, you got to tell stories and also show proofs. Yes. Right. Yes, yeah. Right. And so, uh, you know, I was, I was looking at your LinkedIn, you know, do, doing just a ton of research on this beforehand. Uh, uh, anyways, uh, and, and I saw the, the poem. Is this one of your poems, the As I Gaze Upon the Twinkling Sky, or is that something that... Uh, for that sounds like my poem. Uh, I, yeah. I have a poem in one of my syllabus for one of my classes. <laughs> it summarizes the syllabus. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I don't, I, uh, don't ask me to quote me. I cannot no, remember the poem. Well, well, no, I mean, it's just the, the ending of it, uh, that I'm, I am but a, a trivial pawn in this endless and complex journey towards nowhere. Uh, I mean, it's just, it, it, it's striking. Uh, and I, I think that, uh, for, for me anyways, just reading that and, and, you know, contemplating it a little bit uh, over time, it's not that we're uh, on a journey to nowhere, which is, you know, true in, in a very clinical sense, but it's that we actually are creating our own destinations and, and we're building that and we're creating it for others. And, and what you're doing is helping others create their own destinations. I mean, do, do you see it the same way? You're, you're the one who, who wrote it. So, it so that was written, I think, almost... 15, 20 years back. Uh, my poems at that time used to be a lot more darker. Uh, 
Uh, so there is that's where everybody's man. I mean, when you're a teenager, I mean, it's or in your early not 20s. a teenager. I'm gonna keep correcting you. No, <laughs> I was not a teenager at that time. Uh, but yeah, we, during my teenage days, it was even more uh, relevant. I mean, I had a, a, a rough uh, childhood and teenage days. So for me, poetry was my psychological crutch. Uh, so all the things which I couldn't process, it was going into there. So just just as a caveat, I I. I see the world a little differently now than when, when I had written that uh, poem. So uh, I would agree with you that it's about making our own destiny. But a lot of times I've al also started feeling that it's, uh, it's less stressful if I'm just taking it one step at a time instead of trying to conjure a grand design because I used to love doing it. I used to love planning things out. I used to have schedule which would never work uh, they kept failing and then it would keep stre uh, stressing me out of not having achieved those milestones and things like that. So I've learned to take things as they come. Uh, that has been a development in terms of my own personal growth uh, and not get stressed about any kind of grand designs. The grand designs will happen naturally. And just getting this position as a center director is another instance of that. I did not work towards it. It was not part of my grand design. It's just something that she threw at me as an opportunity, thought about it, and I'm like, okay, let me do this. I feel passionate about it, so I'm absolutely going to do that. So I, I changed it a little bit uh, in terms of how I look at things now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, so, yeah, sometimes you have to uh, go into the darkness to find the light, right? Yeah, yeah. All right, uh, so to uh, end this on a maybe a little bit of a lighter note, uh, so... Uh, and this is a question I pretty much ask everybody. It, it, it just makes my job so much easier and it actually, you know, produces some great answers. Uh, so, so after all we've just talked about, uh, what, what advice do you give to people who are uh, thinking about, you know, starting their own businesses? Uh, it could be students. It could be people who are mid-career. Uh, what, what, what advice do you give to people who are uh, looking to get into business? Or if you don't like that question, just what, what, what general advice do you have for people? Okay. I, th I think I'll, I'll, I'll continue where I uh, left off. Uh, not enough emphasis is given to failures or recognition of failures. I think there is a lot that comes out of failure. Uh, and I'm quoting something that one of my English teachers told me in my high school. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm exactly quoting, but it went something like success is a formula, failure is where you learn. Uh, and that stayed with me. Uh, uh, in the back of my head, because every time I go through the emotional distress of a failure and get over it and then look back at it, I realize that that's taught me something and it becomes a reference point and then you move on. I think it's so much more important for a social entrepreneur uh, because they're not going to succeed on day one. Not everyone does. Out of all the hundred stories that we hear, there are million failed stories that we don't hear about uh, a lot of times, because uh, especially in business literature, we tend to recognize a lot more successes than failures. Somehow good news sells better when it comes to business news. Uh, so we don't hear, hear about the failure. So dealing with failure, learning about it, getting over that slump, I think becomes really important. And through that, there needs to be a personal growth because a social entrepreneur is not going to succeed if they're not going to grow as a person, if they're not going to change who they are. Uh, and everyone needs to change who they are, they are because there's always a scope for improvement in all of us, right? But keeping that in mind that there is this parallel growth happening uh, as a social entrepreneur, as a person, for them, I think it's more necessary than any other career path because they have a lot riding on them. They're not just providing employment. They're not just selling a product. They're just not just providing a service. They're trying to do social good. And that they're not, they won't be able to do it uh, once. They're not able to do it twice. They need to keep persisting. And the way to persist is look back, say, okay, it failed because of XYZ reason. What can I learn from it? What can I do better? Uh, and only then will they be able to have impact uh, on the world uh, is what I feel. So I think that recognizing the importance of failure is the necessary step for that. Yeah, and I, I, I prefer not to think of it as failure. I, I prefer to think of it as creative destruction. Uh, okay. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's but it, it's definitely true. I mean, it, uh, on the startup world that I live in, uh, so I don't know if you know my background, but uh, co-founder of a, uh, a couple of angel funds. Uh, and... 
you know, most of those businesses, the vast, vast, vast majority of those businesses fail. And they've had a billion plus dollars in seed funding. Uh, most of them, or at least a good number of them have. And uh, it just doesn't work out. It's it's so difficult. Uh, and that's also true on the nonprofit side, maybe more so because of all the reasons that you were talking about. It's people who are passionate about uh, redressing a wrong, but they, they don't know the next thing or anything about account. Uh, yeah. And so that's where the, it, they get led astray. All right, Ch Chetan, uh, thank you very much. Uh, do you have anything else to add? How can people reach you or uh, anything else? Uh yeah, so my profile and my contact details are there on our uh, management department website. Uh, so uh, absolutely, if anyone wants to have any kind of conversations about these topics, I'm always open to it. Uh, if there are students who are thinking about doing things around this, or if there are academics, or if there are social entrepreneurs or people in the business who are not sure how they can have a social impact, uh, would love to have those conversations. So yes, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my contact details are there on our department website and hopefully our center website will be up and running soon and that should also give you uh, my contact details. Right. And, and I'll put that information down in the description below the video. And so thank you very much. Uh, Thanks a lot.